And uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I didn't understand it, but I'm sure it was kind. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me say it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and I really feel honored as well to be part of the program. Uh, when Anatoly contacted me about this uh, possibility oh, more than a year and a half ago, I really uh, was quite thrilled, uh, and for two reasons. Uh, first, I'm fairly new to this field. I'm still learning a lot about domestication, and I knew that if I came here and listened to the talks and uh, interacted with people, uh, I would learn a lot more, so I was very pleased about that. Uh, but I was also pleased uh, just with the thought of being able to uh, pay homage to uh, Dmitry Belyayev. Uh, he has been a hero of mine for some time, uh, though uh, for a long time I didn't know that much about him, just his major accomplishments. Now the problem with having a hero is that uh, sometimes you can become disillusioned as you learn more. In the case of Belyayev, that has not been true uh, for me. Uh, as I've learned more, I have come to feel uh, even more what an admirable man, what an admirable human being, and what a fine scientist he was. Uh, so um, uh, uh, it is a, a particular pleasure to be here and to be part of this commemoration of his memory, uh, and of course to uh, participate in exploring uh, how the field has advanced. Uh, now, uh, while we are paying homage to Belyayev, uh, we must also not forget this man, uh, who will be familiar to all of you, uh, not because he's uh, the father of evolutionary biology, uh, and in some sense the father of modern biology, though those would be reasons enough, uh, but because he is really uh, the father of this field of domestication. Uh, and though I think what I'm about to say will be familiar to uh, most or all of you, it's still worth remembering just what he did. Uh, he, was, he was very interested in domestication of animals and plants. Um, and uh, it's clear from his writings that he became fascinated by the subject of what happens to animals and plants uh, when they are bred for, when they are domesticated and bred for particular purposes. But uh, he was not actually, uh, even though he became interested in it for, for its own sake, uh, his goal was something different. He was uh, basically trying to use uh, the knowledge of breeders of domesticated plants and animals to develop a theory of heredity. Now, he was doing this work in the 1850s and 1860s. He was collecting massive amounts of data and thinking about uh, the data and analyzing it. Uh, but remember, there was no science of genetics then. There was no theory of heredity then. Uh, and uh, so he was doing the best he could, uh, which was to talk to the people who thought about heredity and who worked with it, namely uh, the animal and plant breeders. And uh, the fruit of his work was this uh, two-volume work uh, published in 1868, and the full title is Variation in Animals and Plants Under Domestication. Not a particularly exciting title, it doesn't make your pulse race, uh, but this is a very good book, uh, set of books uh, filled with lots of interesting information. But if we ask uh, what, did, uh, what was his major achievement with these books, I think we have to conclude that it was a somewhat mixed picture. Um, basically, he did not achieve a successful uh, theory of heredity, uh, theory of genetics, as we would uh, say today. Uh, uh, he he uh, did indeed uh, arrive at a theory. Uh, he published it in this book. It's the final chapter in this two-volume set. Um, but it was, uh, without going into the details of what was wrong with it, it was immediately criticized by nearly everybody, including some of his uh, strongest supporters. Uh, and when he published uh, a second edition in 1875, seven years later, he starts this uh, chapter in which he uh, gives his theory with a rather plaintive comment that nobody liked his idea, but that he still <coughs> did. So, nevertheless, uh, that idea really did fall by the wayside. It did not have a major influence in uh, uh, thinking about genetics. Ironically, uh, as, as again all of you will know, uh, there was actually a theory of heredity developed about the same time, published in 1866 uh, by an amateur breeder uh, uh, and a, a, an Augustinian friar uh, working in what is now uh, today uh, the Czech Republic, uh, who, uh, namely Gregor Mendel, uh, but Darwin was unaware of his work. Uh, Mendel was very aware of Darwin. Uh, and it's clear from uh, some recent uh, historical analysis that uh, Mendel uh, really had uh, Darwin's ideas in mind while he was 
uh, doing his work. He saw his work on genetics as definitely relevant to thinking about evolution. But Darwin didn't know about Mendel. They both died in uh, 1882, and it would be another 18 years before uh, Mendel's ideas began to be known and before there was a science of genetics. So uh, was uh, Darwin's big work on heredity for nothing? And I would say certainly not. Uh, for one thing, it was a very valuable compilation of uh, knowledge. But there was a real discovery in it. And the discovery was, um, I'm going to leave plants out of the picture and just talk about his work on, on animals. The discovery was that many domesticated animals had uh, shared certain traits that were not found in their non-domesticated wild equivalents. Okay, and we'll take a look at these uh, traits, a uh, table of these traits in a moment. Um, but it was a very interesting finding that uh, Darwin grappled with. There was clearly something about the process of domestication that led to interesting uh, changes in the heredity of the domesticated animals. Um, so uh, when domesticates, uh, humans have domesticated animals uh, initially for uh, uh, certain purposes, uh, but it required uh, making wild animals less wild, hence more docile, less fearful, and more tame. Uh, but then these other traits uh, come along with uh, the process of, of becoming uh, tame and domesticated. And uh, today we have a term for these associated traits, the domestication syndrome. Um, it's not always well defined. It's not entirely clear where it was first used. It seems to have been first used with respect to a similar thing that happens with domesticated plants, uh, but it is a good catch-all term. But let's look at what this domestication syndrome is. And uh, I'm not sure how clear uh, this picture is. This is a scan uh, from a PDF, uh, but I can tell you uh, the main gist of it. This is a table of uh, the traits uh, that are uh, altered, that are different in domesticated animals relative to their wild forebears. Uh, so wherever you see an X, that indicates that one of the traits at the top, in either the yellow box or the, the orange box, uh, is found in the domesticated version of that animal, um, and not seen in the wild progenitor. And uh, the, the difference between the yellow and the uh, slightly orange box uh, has to do with the frequency with which these traits are found in, uh, in domesticates. Uh, there's a lot of information here. I don't want to go into in detail, so I'm just going to stress the main features. First of all, there are a lot of traits that are affected by domestication. Okay, uh, Often when one uses the term syndrome, it refers to a small set of uh, traits, maybe three or four, uh, that uh, are always found together. Uh, here you can see many traits are uh, altered by domestication. Secondly, it's not always the same set of traits in each uh, domesticate. Okay, so each species has its own uh, particular characteristics with respect to domestication. This is not particularly surprising. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one uh, trait that is seen in uh, long-haired domesticates is floppy ears, okay? But short-haired domesticated animals uh, don't have ears big enough to flop, okay? Uh, so there are a number of, of uh, reasonably understandable differences like that. Uh, but the main thing is that uh, there are a lot of traits affected by domestication. Each species is different. And the third point uh, is that, uh, nevertheless, despite those differences, many of these traits come up again and again, okay, independent of, uh, in independent origins. So each, I think there are 26 animals uh, symbolized there. Uh, uh, in each, each of those domestications, or certainly most of them, were independent of the others, and yet similar traits come up. That indicates uh, at least certain shared, altered developmental processes involved in uh, the act of domestication. So uh, the first part of this slide just goes over that, uh, what I just said. And, but we now come to the explicit genetic question. Uh, I'm a geneticist by training. I'm interested in genetics. Many of you, probably most of you, are interested in genetics too. What are the gene sets affected in domestication? What are the domestication genes? And from that table that we saw, uh, we can already make a guess that uh, there are going to be uh, probably a lot of uh, domestication genes, and also that the sets of domestication genes in each domesticated animal might be somewhat different. Well, broadly, there are two uh, possibilities. 
indicated diagrammatically here. Uh, the first is that there are wholly independent sets of genes, that if we uh, look at the uh, genomes of uh, different domesticated animals and compare them to their wild forebears where we can, uh, or to uh, DNA samples from those forebears, uh, we will simply find a whole sea of uh, di independent differences. The fact that there are phenotypic similarities, uh, a large set of overlapping phenotypic similarities, indicates that it's probably not that simple, that there probably are shared things. And if those shared things are at the level of genes, then the picture uh, is probably more like uh, those Venn diagrams at the bottom, namely that there are uh, some, indeed, shared genetic uh, differences amongst the domesticates, uh, as indicated uh, in the, the, color, uh, the colors of that Venn diagram on the left, or the uh, three sets of uh, different kinds of letters uh, in the uh, uh, diagram on the right. Uh, if I had a pointer, maybe I do have a pointer. Yes, okay. Uh, so and, uh, we might even suppose if there are these kinds of overlaps between different domesticates uh, for their genes that in the center of these Venn diagrams, there might even be genes uh, that are common to, uh, gene alterations, I should say, that are common to all the domesticates. That's a hypothesis, it's really just a guess. Another possibility is that uh, the genes themselves, may there may not be a, a distinct uh, common shared set of gene alterations, but there may be a common set of genes in terms of their function that are altered, okay? And we, we will come to this possibility in a moment. Now, uh, in this age of genomics, uh, where one can sequence things and do comparisons, in this case between uh, the genomes of domesticated animals and uh, their wild counterparts, or sometimes, as I say, DNA that's been preserved of uh, extinct animals or long gone animals, uh, in principle genomics uh, can tell us uh, what uh, the genetic differences are. Nevertheless, it helps, it always helps to have a hypothesis to guide uh, in terms of uh, what you're looking for. Okay, if you just do a blind search, you might miss things. So it helps to have a hypothesis. And here I'm going to give you four. Uh, okay, so uh, I've already uh, dealt with this question. Is there a core set of common genetic changes? Now let's look at some hypotheses. Uh, I've only listed four. Uh, these are the four that I'm really aware of and that I've uh, thought most about. Um, I can't swear that there are, aren't others uh, that may be hidden in the German literature and the Russian literature. Uh, I can read German to some extent, not super well, but to some extent I don't read any Russian. Uh, a lot of, I would I say probably most of the good work in domestication science has been done uh, in Germany and Russia, uh, interestingly. Uh, so there may be things I'm leaving out, but we, we can nevertheless identify four uh, distinct hypotheses, and I'll go through them quickly. So the first is uh, what I'm calling the null hypothesis, that each case of domestication is, uh, is different, uh, and that the initiating genes are quite different in each case. In other words, uh, that first uh, diagram I showed you with the uh, sep totally separate circles. Uh, so this may not sound very interesting, but it's a possibility that uh, we can keep in mind. Secondly, there's the genetic regulatory network, or GRN hypothesis, that the properties altered in domestication are all underlain by a large genetic regulatory network, and that upstream mutations in this genetic network cause the domestication syndrome. So as you will know, those of you who have looked at uh, genetic regulatory networks, there is a kind of temporal sequence of changes that uh, start early, that uh, create a cascade of further genetic regulatory changes moving down. If you alter uh, the top, uh, the early part of the acting genetic regulatory <coughs> network, uh, you will alter things downstream. Um, so this would explain why so many things are um, are altered uh, in uh, in domesticates. Okay, if there is one big uh, genetic regulatory network and you've altered things upstream. I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, I'm trying to speak clearly. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone and everyone afterwards to clarify points if I have gone too fast. Uh, so, uh, I think we can uh, credit uh, this idea to Dmitry Belyaev. I think he was the first to uh, put it forward and to Ludmilla Trut, who has also discussed it. Uh, 
this hypothesis uh, is, is good. I think it's probably got a germ of truth. I'll, I'll come back to it in, in a moment or two. Uh, but it doesn't really give you a clue as to which genes to look for. This next hypothesis does. Uh, I'm calling this the thyroid hormone hypothesis, or THH, that domestication involves uh, neoteness, slowed down development, in other words, prolonged juvenile, juvenilization, and that alterations in thyroid hormone metabolism are chiefly responsible for this uh, prolonged juvenilization. Uh, and this idea relates to an older idea that was very current in the 70s and 80s, maybe the early 90s, it's a little bit less current today, uh, that uh, thinks of domestication as, in effect, a kind of con uh, prolonged juvenile state uh, uh, of, of the animals. Uh, thyroid hormones are very important in regulating the rate of growth and maturation. Uh, and so if one takes this point of view uh, that uh, domestication has this character, slowed down development, uh, then alterations in thyroid hormone metabolism uh, would be a good candidate. And this idea uh, comes from Susan Crockford, uh, who has published it in a few places, but most extensively in a book in uh, 2002. Again, I'm just giving abbreviated references. Anybody who wants the full reference, I'll uh, give those to you. Uh, and we'll come to the genetic uh, implications in a moment, or the genetic predictions. Finally, there's uh, the neural crest cell hypothesis, uh, that the domestication syndrome is underlain by alterations in mild or small deficits of neural crest cells for the different traits altered in the domestication syndrome. And uh, this uh, idea was published uh, in, uh, three years ago, in 2014. Uh, so I was one of the authors, and my co-authors were Richard Wrangham, Harvard, and Tecumseh Fitch of the University of Vienna. Now, what are the genetic predictions? Of, 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 so in a sense, uh, the first two hypotheses don't really give you too, much clue, too many clues as to where you should look, uh, what genes you should look for. These do, and very briefly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the, the biology to save time. I'm not going to go through the biology. <laughs> Uh, of thyroid uh, metabolism. It's fairly straightforward. As I mentioned, the key point is that uh, the thyroid hormones affect lots of things, uh, lots of processes, many of which are involved in the uh, domestication syndrome. Uh, and I'll also not say too much about uh, neural press cells. Uh, the, the key point is that uh, these are cells that arise in early embryonic development as a strip along the uh, dorsal neural tube. Uh, and they migrate out both in the head, in the cranium, uh, and in the trunk, the main body, uh, and uh, in those different locations give rise to different cell types. And <clears throat> this is a, uh, this is a, a picture from uh, our 2014 paper uh, indicating uh, some of the sites of migration shown in blue of neural crest cells uh, and the different organs uh, and tissues and, place, uh, and sites that are affected in the domestication syndrome. Uh, this has been superimposed on a hypothetical or a cartoon fox. Uh, and the yellow indicates the uh, central nervous system in reference. So now let's look at the uh, genetic, uh, basic uh, genetic or genomic prediction groups. So uh, the thyroid hormone hypothesis predicts that mutations in genes of thyroid metabolism will be found in genomic studies of all domesticated animals. If domestication is due to alterations in thyroid metabolism, then this, it, it's, it's reasonable to say, to predict that uh, domesticated animals should have uh, mutations in thyroid metabolism that uh, will be specific to the domesticates that you don't see in the uh, equivalent wild strains. Uh, the key point uh, is that uh, there are relatively few steps uh, that uh, are involved in thyroid metabolism. And since the changes must be either upregulations of the thyroid hormones or downregulations of the thyroid hormones, uh, this idea implicitly predicts that uh, the number of mutations involved is small and should be fairly <coughs> readily identifiable with thyroid metabolism. Susan Crockford did not spell this out in any of her papers. Uh, I, I'm drawing that as, as my inference and implication. Okay, what about uh, the neural crest cell hypothesis? Well, that predicts that mutations in neural crest cell genes will be found in genomic studies of, of all domesticated animals, if this is a general explanation. 
and there are many neural crest cell chains, okay, uh, on the orders of, of dozens, possibly hundreds, but certainly dozens. And what do I mean by neural crest cell chains? These, uh, to make that a bit more precise, these are genes that are involved uh, and required for either neural crest cell development or migration or uh, are uh, essential for uh, expression in particular derivatives, particular cell types derived from the neural crest. So there's now been a lot of genomic work, particularly in the last four years. Uh, it's been very satisfying. Uh, if one wants to uh, get at this question of uh, are there, uh, uh, are either of these hypotheses um, borne out? Uh, and this is uh, a table that I've lifted from my recent paper that's going into the uh, Vavilov Journal, a uh, special issue that accompanies this symposium. Uh, and uh, this is my compilation of the data. Uh, it's possible I've missed some things. I'm not really a, um, I'm not a bioinformatician. I'm not a gene ontologist. Uh, so I read these things as an interested amateur. But I don't think I'm too far wrong in saying that the upshot is that re very few, I could only find two, uh, 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 genetic differences uh, that are implicated with uh, thyroid hormone metabolism uh, specific to domesticates. And these two changes, one in cats and one in dogs, are not uh, genetically fixed changes. They're merely alterations that are uh, increased in frequency in the domesticates. In contrast, uh, there are a lot of mutations. I think the number, the total here is 25. Uh, uh, that uh, are clear genetic alterations affecting specific neurocrest cell genes. So, uh, uh, accepting uh, the um, qualifications I've given you about my lack of expertise and so on, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, provisionally this indicates uh, that uh, there is a <coughs> strong support for the uh, THH. Uh, there's only weak support for it at best. Uh, but there's um, a much stronger support in terms of the number of genes uh, for the neural crest cell hypothesis. But I would also register two uh, strong qualifications or things we should keep in mind. Uh, first of all, there is a, a key thyroid hormone met metabolism gene, uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor gene in chickens, which has been implicated in several aspects of the domestication syndrome in chickens. Okay. So uh, thyroid hormone metabolism may uh, certainly seems to be involved in some aspects of domestication in chickens and by extension birds, and uh, we should not consider it ruled out. Uh, uh, there are also uh, relations between uh, thyroid hormone metabolism and, uh, and neural crest cells. Uh, you need, uh, as evidenced by some experimental evidence, you need uh, the low levels of thyroid hormone metabolism um, in the early embryo in order to get uh, proper full migration of neural crest cells. Okay, so, so I'm not saying we should forget about thyroid hormone metabolism, but I think the original Crockford hypothesis is not looking very likely. Uh, so uh, whereas the neural crest cell hypothesis is looking reasonable. But uh, my caveat there is that uh, the screens that have been done have really concentrated on coding sequences, Mo most of the screens that have been done. Uh, so there's the possibility that the screens that have been done are missing a lot of the key genetic changes, specifically those in crucial cis regulatory sequences, the so-called conserved non-coding elements. Okay, uh, these uh, are easy to identify uh, in the rabbit study, uh, which is the one study that has uh, ex um, covered uh, these non-coding uh, elements. Uh, uh, many, many mutations have been found in those. The problem is associating key uh, conserved, uh, uh, conserved non-coding <coughs> elements with particular genes. I'm keeping track of the time, but I think I have three or four more minutes. Seven. Seven? Oh, great. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the, the problem, as I say, is uh, in uh, connecting particular uh, conserved non-coding elements with particular genes because uh, often uh, these conserved non-coding elements can be hundreds of thousands to millions of base pairs away. Okay, so there's still a lot of work to be done in, in figuring out which genes are uh, affecting their regulation up or down uh, in domesticates versus their, their wild forebears. Okay, 
Uh, so I think that's about all I want to say about comparative genomics and these various hypotheses. And I'd now like to take my remaining time and focus on this specific question, uh, the, the basis of tameness. Remember, tameness uh, almost certainly was the, the quality that was initially selected for uh, uh, when, uh, when animals were domesticated. So what's its genetic basis and what's its neurological basis? In the thyroid hormone hypothesis, uh, it's a bit vague, uh, but I think Susan Crockford uh, felt that uh, if you simply extend the juvenile period, uh, juvenilization, uh, that that might be uh, in development, that that might uh, sufficiently explain it. That uh, juvenile animals tend to be less afraid, more playful, more sociable uh, mammals, anyway. Uh, so uh, their tameness would be a reflection of their extended juvenility. Okay? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I can say anything more than that, but that's my interpretation of, of uh, her idea. Uh, what about uh, our idea, the neuropressel hypothesis? Well, we gave two possible explanations. Um, first uh, of all, uh, this one. Uh, we know that in several domesticates, there's been a reduction in the adrenal glands and also in the levels of adrenocorticotropic hormones, the stress hormones. So uh, it, uh, if you have a reduced stress response, uh, there will probably be a reduced fear of humans. Uh, the animals learn humans are OK. Uh, and uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. But this uh, predisposes toward uh, growing up and remaining tame. Uh, another possibility is this, that uh, the tameness is an indirect uh, reflection of reduced forebrain size. Now, one um, aspect or one feature of the domestication syndrome that I haven't mentioned is that nearly all domesticates have reduced is it's predominantly in the forebrain areas, uh, the telencephalon and the diencephalon and their, their derivatives. Uh, so uh, uh, conceivably, tameness is an indirect uh, side effect of reduced forebrain size. And how, uh, how specifically does this uh, effect uh, work out? Well, very briefly, and this is work that was done in GIF uh, by uh, the very uh, big and excellent neuropress cell group uh, in GIF, uh, formerly headed by Nicole Le Duarin, uh, but the particular work I'm going to describe uh, was done by uh, several of her people, but in particular uh, a young woman scientist named Sophie uh, Kreutze, so I'm going to call this the Sophie Kreutze effect. Uh, what she found was that uh, cranial neuropress cells secrete uh, lots of FGF8, uh, which in turn promotes telencephalon and diencephalon development, and it does so by suppressing apoptosis. Uh, so, uh, a question is whether uh, these effects are quantitative. What if uh, there's some reduction in cranial neuropress cells? Not enough to be lethal, but just enough to uh, create uh, some differences. Would there be a reduction in FGF8, and then some reduction uh, in the amount of apoptosis suppressed, so that you'd end up uh, with uh, uh, so somewhat fewer cells in the uh, developing forebrain? This is an open question. I've talked to Sophie. Uh, but not recently. She was interested in investigating. I need to get back to her to ask if she's taken this any further. Uh, if this mechanism does pertain, then the question is, is the neural circuitry governing tameness affected by such reductions? Now, I am in the home stretch, uh, but just a few quick things. Uh, so, uh, so I have to leave that question uh, unresolved for you, but uh, leave it as an interesting question. What is the basis of, of tameness? Uh, the, uh, genetic basis and the neurological basis. Uh, but an extension of that question is uh, relates to the possibility uh, of, uh, or at least the question of self-domestication uh, that has occurred in a few key species. Uh, have these species tamed themselves? Now we've heard from uh, Stephen that cats are uh, in this category. I hadn't quite thought of cats that way, but I think that it's quite possible. <coughs> cats voluntarily associated with humans uh, were kind of adopted by them. And uh, the, the tameness of house cats reflects this kind of coming together of two species that, that like, uh, or at least tolerate each other, uh, tolerate each other and then began to like each other. There's also, uh, even though Steve's, uh, Steve dismissed uh, dog evolution uh, as having a different character, uh, uh, there is actually a pretty good argument that uh, the wolves to dogs uh, evolution also involves something similar. Wolves hanging around human settlements.
uh, becoming used to people, the people becoming used to them, um, then uh, slowly, uh, you know, sort of joining uh, them, joining forces. This is hypothetical, but it's an idea that's discussed. Uh, another instance of self-domestication that's been argued very strongly by Richard Graham, one of my co-authors, uh, and uh, and a number of his colleagues, is that the bonobos, the pygmy chimps, are a self-domesticated uh, kind of chimpanzee. And finally, and this question is way too big for me to go into, uh, some of you are, are aware of it, are modern humans uh, a self-domesticated animal relative to other hominins which no longer exist, perhaps like the Neanderthal? Uh, this is a big set of questions. Darwin, uh, just one more minute, I'm almost there. Uh, <laughs> Darwin wrestled with it unsuccessfully. He argued that humans acted like domesticated animals, but since there was nobody to uh, uh, domesticate them, uh, it couldn't be. And you can uh, see this tension in Darwin's writings. This is in uh, The Descent of Man. He just can't, uh, 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 he can't figure out the whole thing, that humans seem so domesticated, but there was no domesticator. Well, the idea of self-domestication, that this is something that evolves within a community uh, and a population over time, uh, he didn't quite reach. Okay, so... Uh, just very briefly, uh, I'm just going to give you this paper. This is about uh, uh, the evidence for two genes, which are, I should add, neuropress cell genes, which have now been implicated in not mere cleanliness, but hypersociability in dogs. Okay? And uh, uh, I'm just because of time, I'm not going to read this, which is the abstract, but just give you the reference. For those of you who don't have time to write it down, I'll give it to you later. Uh, but let me just say that this is something that uh, uh, this is an issue that I face not just out of scientific interest, but every day in my personal life, because I now have an 18-month-old uh, flat-coated retriever whose name is Wolfie, in homage to his uh, uh, canid origins. Uh, and Wolfie, uh, this is not a picture of Wolfie, but this is what he looks like, uh, very much so, uh, is a hyper-sociable dog. He's always interested in meeting new people and uh, new dogs. And after I read this paper by Von Holtz uh, et al., I found myself wondering, uh, is Wolfie uh, mutant or altered in uh, those two genes that are the subject of that paper? And uh, could possibly the elite, super-friendly domesticated foxes be altered in them? Now, uh, the chairman is really calling my time, so I'm not going to uh, go through these list of interesting questions, um, but I'm happy to discuss any of them with you. And I'm just going to end by saying uh, that uh, these are pictures of the two guys with whom I uh, developed, uh, uh, or the three of us helped develop this neuropress cell hypothesis, Richard Rang of Harvard, uh, to come to Fitch of the University of Vienna. Uh, two terrific guys, a pleasure to work with them. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, I'll tell you the story of how the three of us got hooked up to uh, work on this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry. I got